Welcome. I'm Stephen Winnick with the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and this interview is part of the 2021 Homegrown at Home concert series. In this series, we've asked wonderful traditional musicians from all over the world to record concert videos and send them to us. This began as a measure to keep everyone safe during the COVID-19 pandemic, but still maintain the tradition of bringing you homegrown concerts. So on the Library of Congress website and YouTube channel, you'll find many concert videos, both recorded live at the Library of Congress and since 2020, recorded in or near musicians' homes and sent to us. So today, my special guest is Martin Carthy, a master English folk singer and guitarist with a career spanning about 60 years. And we had so much to talk about that this is the second part of our interview. So Martin, welcome again to the Library of Congress virtual interview studio. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's good to see you again. <laughs> so we're going to begin approximately where we left off in the last interview, and that brings us to the point at which you joined a singing group. We were talking about uh, Steel Eye Span, where you got to play very loud on your guitar. And oh, then, yeah. of, of course, you were in another group in which you practically didn't play the guitar very much at all. You mostly just sang. And that is the Watersons. So I guess the Watersons pre-existed as Norma's group. So you can sort of begin by explaining how you came to meet Norma Watterson and join the Watersons. Well, Norma and I met first and um, both fell madly in love. But uh, at the time, uh, she was married and I wasn't. So we circled each other for a, for, for a while and then we met up again. And this time I was married and she wasn't. So we continued <laughs> cir circling each other. Norma went away to... The Watersons came off the road in, um, I suppose, 68... 67, 68, and uh, they, the, the, the whole the whole family just sort of, uh, splintered for a short while. Uh, Lel went to live in Leeds. Mike mm -hmm. stayed in Hull. Um, John Harrison went down to London, and uh, Norma went to to to, to Montserrat, right? Um, with with her her then her then partner, who um, who. <laughs> Who, well, they broke up pretty, pretty much immediately. They they they, they arrived in Montserrat, and uh, she stayed there for three three nearly four years, and, and became a DJ and was very good at it by the sound mm -hmm. of it. She had a great time, um, radio ra radio Antilles. Um, she had a, she she had a great time. In se at the end of seventy one, beginning of seventy two, she came back. And uh, she and I met, and we stopped circling each other. And, and, and uh, well, first the thing that, that brought us together was making an album of Mike and Lau's songs, which uh, which they that the two of them had written either together or, or individually in the time that Norma was away. Um, Lau had always been uh, had always written poetry and always written a few songs, but she actually. Really got down to cases and, and wrote some 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 utterly marvelous songs, and I was up there I think doing d doing a steel eye gig in Hull when um when, when I was invited to go and stay stay at Lyle's house with you know, her and George, and and so that's what I did, and she played no I beg your pardon I stayed at Mike's house I stayed mm -hmm. at Mike's house. And um, and he took me over in the, in the, the, the following day to, to Lau because he uh, he and she wanted me to hear the songs that they'd been writing. And one of the first songs that uh, that that Lau played to me was a thing called "Never the Same," and I was absolutely thunderstruck by this song. So you were in fact never the same after you heard it. <laughs> I was no. Oh by God, I was not the same. Um, and sang a few more songs, and some uh, some of Mike's were were, were lovely, but but there, there was a, there was a depth and a, and a poetic um, poetic instinct in, in what Lau was writing that was just 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 what's that? I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> was at a loss for words then, and I still am. So. Um, and these, of course, are Mike and Lal are, of course, uh, Norma's brother and sister. Exactly. And the three of them had been part of the Watersons prior to the breakup that you mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. 
Um, so the, the the three of them were were, were back together by the time, um, by the time, uh, by the time we thought of doing an album. I I spoke. I went 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 back from from from, uh, from Hull. Uh, from the Steel Eye gig, and I met up with with Ashley Hutchings, and I said, "You've really got to hear these songs that that mm. that, uh, that that Mike and Lal have written t together, and but most of the time individually." And said, "They're, f they're fabulous songs." Oh, says he, um, oh, "Sounds like an album to me." Yeah. And the first thing he did was go and see Bill Leader and say, "There's a possibility. Are you interested?" And Bill said, "You bet, I'm interested." Uh, he he was no longer exclusively uh, working for for Topic, recording for Topic, but he had his own own lab, labels labels. Right, a, a label called Leader, on which he put uh, tradition rock, uh, the old fashioned singers, the old you know, the old fellas and the old ladies, um, and then he had an album for for for, for traditionalists like me and or like anybody else who was interested, which he called Trailer. Right, leading and trailer, which is, uh, and it was it was very successful, and he really didn't. He, he he thought it was his duty to to record the fact that one of the things that was happening to to, to traditional English music was that it was changing in our hands. You know, our, our scruffs were, were actually changing it, and sometimes right. in very interesting ways. Sometimes not so interesting, but yeah, <laughs> you know, that's that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you never so, know what's going to work. You have to experiment. So yeah. exactly, exactly. So, um, uh, so I mean, so it, it, I mean, it was Im immediately very interesting, and, and and the thing was set up. And um, cut it cut a long story short. We took a week in May seventy two, Norma having come home for Christmas seventy one, and was proposing to go back, but. Um, uh, she didn't go back to begin with, and then um, the two of us saw to it that she never went back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I can't say it was it was uh, it was all my doing. I, I was just um, yeah, I was uh, I was free. Yeah, and uh, and so was she. Well, no, she was she was she was with somebody, but uh, um, you yeah. <laughs> know, one of those things, right? <laughs> one of those things, you know. Yeah. It was. It wasn't uh, anything permanent. Yeah. And um, I had a couple of hints um, by the way people were behaving that this was uh, this was coming to an end. So I yeah. uh, did what I could to encourage that <laughs> situation. <laughs> like yeah. you do. And um, I mean, in May, it, it's the. It started funnily enough. Um. My birthday is twenty first of May, and we started recording. I think, I think, I think on the, on the twentieth. I'm not going to stake my life on it, but it, it, my birthday was 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 there at right. that time, and we recorded all week, all that 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 week of uh, of, of late May, and um, it was just we, we were far too busy. And, far too busy actually recording and working on what we were going to do and people had gone away and, and learned the the, the, the the songs that that it, had, it was agreed that we would record and uh what ashley had done was was go away and put a band together right and he first person he rang was richard thompson um so the, the band uh, and and then dave mattax so the the the, the band was uh, was uh, Ashley, me, Richard, and 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 Dave Mattox, um, and then there were other people. That, that is, those are those are no people to sneeze at, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I came very quickly to realise just what a monstrously good musician uh, uh, Richard Thompson was yeah. then and, and is now. He's he's huge. Yeah, but um. We we recorded it very successfully. It was very exciting, and everything came together like that. Mm -hmm. It was quite quite extraordinary. And, and that uh, is, that's the Bright Phoebus album. Was that the that is Bright Phoebus? You're yeah, quite right. 
Um, and all sorts of fascinating things happened. One poor bloke came came to set. Well, it was recorded in, in downstairs in Cecil Sharp House. Mm -hmm. And one time a, a bloke came to deliver a parcel, and we let him in and uh, shoved a, 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 a set of words in his hand and said, "Sing that chorus." And he went, "What? <laughs> I'm not a singer. Yeah, you are. Just just learn it and sing it." And, but I'm just delivering a parcel. Well, we'll, we'll deal with that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> gave him the words and he sang and he sort of looked a bit grumpy to begin with and then really got into it and <laughs> didn't want to go <laughs> he was like well stay around now i've got to go grumble 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 <laughs> and um so we, we, it, it was it was as light as that and there were all sorts of people in in, in the room i mean tim hart and maddie pryor were there for, for a couple of songs annie briggs was there mm -hmm. for, for a few days and it was a it was a total delight Mm -hmm. Total delight. So many people. Uh, I mean, it seemed occasionally like half the folk scene was there. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time, and we got, we all went and slept 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 on the floor at, at Bill Leader's place. Um, Nora and I managed to stay up talking until about three o'clock in the morning every night, and then go to our go to our our, our respective beds. Right. Um, we were all very respectful of one another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, because there was a job to be done and we were both we were all focused like mad on it and it was a, an utterly wonderful experience and mm -hmm. uh, I, I went off to do a gig which which turned out to be um, an imaginary gig um, somewhere around Bristol and I got there and there was no gig so oh. I was very really fed up and Norma and I had agreed to meet at the at the, at the uh, Cleethorpes Folk Festival. Cleethorpe is just outside Grimsby. It's on the on on the northeast. It's 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 very close to. Um, it, it's it's across the the River Humber, from uh, fr from Hull. So it's mm -hmm. it's on the southern the southern bank of the uh, of the Humber. Right. Well, and round the corner a bit. Um, and we, we met up there, and uh, and that's where I proposed, and she said, yeah. <laughs> All right, right, and and we, we we got married two and a half weeks later, three weeks later, just well, it may, weeks later. It, it may be a bit late to say congratulations for that, <laughs> but <Thank you. laughs> but congratulations, uh, and <laughs> and so presumably that the relationship also led to uh, your becoming part of the Watersons as a as a singing well, entity. Well, the the the, the Watersons had had already become a singing entity again with with, with a guy called Bernie Vickers, who was an, a really nice singer, still is a very nice singer, who is uh, f from Hull, and he was uh, Mike's business partner, um, and Mike being in business as a as a builder, mm -hmm. um, uh, builder, painter, and decorator. He was he was apprenticed as a painter and decorator, and he learned all the other all the other bits. From anybody he was working with so he but by the time he'd been at it for about 14 years 15 years he was uh he could build a house right which was a pretty good position to be <laughs> in <because laughs> very, that, very helpful skill yeah very helpful skill because we were you know we eventually moved uh, a few miles up the road to 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 robin hood's bay to a farm and we were all crammed into one house and there were lots of outbuildings so the outbuildings needed turn needed turning into two more houses, which happened very slowly because we didn't have any money, and were you know buying a. I can't say I was. I usually say a brick at a time. But, but the, what the thing it was a stone built house, so the you know, the, the, the the bits of uh, the stone were like that big. So it was right. millions of them. A, a, bl um, a block at a time, perhaps. A block yeah. at a time. <laughs> But we uh, it took five years, but we eventually ended up e each in our own house, each family, mm -hmm. Lau's family, Norma's family, and Mike's family. And there were a couple of births while we were up there as well. Uh, Mike and Anne had uh, had two more children. They arrived with two and eventually left with four. Mm -hmm. um, Norma and I had Eliza. Eliza was born. Um, now we'll get this right. Yeah, by uh, yeah, by that time we uh, we hadn't we were still we were still in the uh, we, we were still all in one house mm -hmm. when when Liza was born in seventy five seventy five um, and that was a drama as well because uh, Eliza was a placenta previa 
Oh right. And that's that's uh, that was that wasn't. Uh, it could have been very nasty, but uh, you know, luck was on our side. And uh, uh, George um, d- drove like the wind on mm-hmm. the wrong side of the road uh, for the entire from the, for the thirteen miles between St Ives Farm, where we lived, and Scarborough Hospital. And we were we never met another car coming in the in mm-hmm. the other direction. Astonishing. Thank yeah, uh, we, were pra- we were actually praying for a for, for a police car, uh, but um, no, we we got there, and Norma had had Eliza, which was wonderful. Thank you very yeah. much. But, um, <laughs> Congratulations on that as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean the, the um, when, when Norma and I first got first got married in seventy two, uh, this is now seventy five. But mm-hmm. when we got married in seventy two. Uh, the first thing I did, which was incredibly helpful of me, was join the Albion Country Band, uh, which was uh, a, a guaranteed loss maker. Right. Uh, and yeah, I, think I, I, I remember getting getting one check that where, where the uh, the bloke who was organising it all said, "Everybody gets paid this week, yeah. nine weeks' wages," and we thought, "Wow, nine weeks' wages!" And there was my and I looked at my check and it was forty five pounds. Yeah. <laughs> for my nine weeks work uh, how we managed how we survived how we didn't starve to death i'll never know but we uh we, we managed not to but it was uh it, it, i really enjoyed the albion country band it was it ended up as a, as a very good band indeed and then we had just had to turn our backs on it and walk away because right it was hopeless but it was a bloody good band really yeah nice. i made some beautiful yeah. recordings as well so oh, yeah, yeah. That, that the album the battle of the field was uh, yeah was, uh, there's some some really really very very good stuff on that, but there we are. There we are. There um, you are. Yeah. And, and short, very shortly after that, um, I I'd been an occasional fifth member of the of the Watersons. You know, if I had a, had a night off, I would go and be a, be a Waterson, uh, maybe in the second half, and really enjoying it and finding out how to sing with 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 those people, because uh, they, they're they had changed the rules entirely right they really did change everything when they came on the scene um because all groups back then we called them groups then not bands um all groups back then were based on the weavers you know mm-hmm. there was always there was a banjo player always a, always a guitar player and always a girl singer you know and, and the other others could sing too but that was that that seemed to be the rule Right, um, and along came came the Watsons, and you see pictures of them brandishing guitars. But what they became known for was this 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 way of singing that they had devised. Well, Normal Al and Mike had devised from when they when they were tiny, because they always used to sing together. Yeah, and um, the two the, the two girls were were altos, and that meant that Mike had to find find a way of singing with these two with these two altos, and he he he, he manufactured a fabulous range. I mean, he had a range of three octaves or something. Wow! He could go right down right down into the dungeon to sing, and he could go way 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 high, and it was just his his capacity and their capacity for invention would blow your mind but they did an awful lot in it pretty close to just just unison yeah and the sort of the sort of the, the sort of blend the sort of thing you can achieve in you know with two altos and one you know what do you want to call him tenor occasional bass right um, like mike is extraordinary and when they would suddenly burst out into harmony I remember the first time I heard them sing in the troubadour. They sang, um, what's the the, 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 the song of the what is it? three score and ten, mm-hmm. in three score and ten, and every 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 chorus they, they would sing three 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 three. three I said it was three score and ten boys and men from Whitby Town, from Yarmouth down to Scarborough. Many hundreds more were drowned, and they would this, they would this great bloom of of, of yeah. harmony with them. And you could see people in the audience just rocking back on their seats. They'd never heard anything like it. You know, but then they would go back into this this uh, 
this this extraordinary almost um unison yeah i one of the great things about that situation that you're describing where you had two altos and a tenor bass person yeah. was that you know it wasn't the standard arrangement where someone was singing the melody and other people were singing harmony parts you couldn't always tell who was on the melody the melody note always came <laughs> but it might be passed around among the three singers uh in a unconventional right. way <laughs> Absolutely right. You could yeah. actually, yeah, tra oh, there it is. There's the tune. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's br absolutely brilliant. And learning to sing a thing, sing that way. And Norma said to me, if you want to know, she said, the thing to do is you sing the tune until you can't and then sing a harmony. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, that's the rule. That's the rule. <laughs> and, and, and it was bent and bent and, and been completely out of shape sometimes. Yeah. But that That was... That was why just just stick to stick to the stick to the to, to the melody until you, until you get a bright idea, you know, oh, then go off and do it, you know. But you know, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. how was it figuring it out? I mean, because you had it's to fabulous. learn. It's fabulous. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the 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 only thing I re I regretted was that I couldn't do. The, uh, I I didn't have that fabulous bass voice that John Harrison had. I mean, they did. They did yeah. the song which they learned from the Elliots of Berkeley. Um, what's it called? Um, oh, damn it! Hmm. Uh, Rapper to Bank. Right. Rapper Rapper to Bank. Bank. Yeah. And they had actually recorded it on the on 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 the Red album, and it wasn't didn't manage to get out. And it, it but it, it's available if you ever hear the Watsons sing it. Yeah, just what they do with it is just astonishing. And it's wonder because it's it's a wonderful soul. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to wish that we could sing that song, and I could sing that low, you know, yeah, <laughs> low part because the oh, it's wonderful, but I couldn't. So I just you, you went, went with what I'd got. You do what you can exactly. Yeah, and it's it was it was very exciting stuff. Really, really was. It is. Yeah, they, they changed everything. They really yeah. did. Yeah. Well, and, and so this is you then in your adopted family, the family that you married into yeah. um, performing. And ultimately that also led to, you know, you mentioned Liza being born in 1975, but this led to you working with Eliza as a great musician in her own right oh, later yeah. on in, in Waters and Carthy. So talk a little about that experience about forming a band with your own nuclear family. <laughs> Well, it was um, we we um, we were coming to the states <coughs> to 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 to, uh, to go to to West West Virginia, Augusta, um, yeah. And uh, Norma was doing some workshops, and I was especially on on on, on gypsy singers, and I was do I was doing I was doing other workshops, so sort of playing just just playing people stuff and, and tr tr trying to get people to understand or just listen to um some of the extraordinary things that that, that uh, those so-called so-called old-fashioned singers get up to because they're, they're just utterly wonderful and, and liberating and different uh, they don't follow the follow the rules at all it's, and that's that's especially true of gypsy singers they uh they just they they, they 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 seem to exist in, in what I've sometimes called a pre um what do they call that pre uh we yeah, pre well tempered scale oh right yes <laughs> you know, it, yeah, uh, and some of the things they get up to with 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 with, with a mind like that is is one utter, utterly wonderful and rhythmically just. Entire, entirely distinct. It's wonderful. I, I, when I first heard uh, Levy Smith and then his uh, his his brother, um, oh Martin, come on, wake up. Um, Jasper, hmm. yeah, Levy, Levy and Jasper Smith singing Georgie. I was just stunned. You know, just, and I'd also got my hands on some 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 uh, recordings uh, from cylinder recordings from uh before the first world war and some of the music that was that that, that uh, people like 
um, Gardner and uh, Vaughan Williams and obviously Percy Granger. Right. And, and Cecil Sharp too. Cecil Sharp did, did a bit of recording, but he ultimately didn't like it. Yes. Because <laughs> I, 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 he always talked about, oh, well, if, if, you, if you're not recording and you're listening to the tune, you get a, I, when I write it down, he says, I get a better sense of the tune. Um, and I've, I've, but that's what he, that's what he said. That's what he believed. I've, I, I can't, I, I, I don't understand, but because I, I've, I've benefited so much from hearing those very old recordings and they're, yes. they're, 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 they're pretty, they're quite, quite damaged some of them, but you, you can still get a good, good grasp of what, uh, what's, what's happening. Uh, and it's very exciting and very, very mind expanding. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah, I, I find if if you read those old collectors' writings, a lot of them didn't really think about the posterity of it. They wanted to make a recording so that they could produce a transcription <laughs> uh, mm. by listening to the recording many times rather than having the singer sing it many times, which mm. was noble in its own right, but the, you know, not thinking about the value that the recording mm. itself was going to yeah. bring to the world. It was just yeah. part of their time, I guess. It wasn't you know, there was no malice in it, but it would have been great oh, yeah. if more of them had saved and or uh, made recordings uh, from those days. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yes. So, yeah. So you were going to tell us a little about forming Watterson Carthy. Well, yeah. Yes. So we went to we went to Augusta uh, in in, um, in West Virginia and um, it was just a wonderful, utterly wonderful week. And then we discovered that at the end of the week, um, I mean, Peggy Seeger was there, and it was just after Ewan had died. Yeah. And uh, so she she was doing some stuff as well. And um, she, uh, well, we all suddenly realised that at the end of the week, you know, the the, uh, the people who, who, who were coming to the workshops were giving little concerts every now and again. And at the end of the week, the tutors had to stand up and be counted. <laughs> <laughs> And um, th and the three of us had, uh, Liza had recently, uh, more, actually, a bit, I was going to say recently started on the fiddle. She, no, she, she was playing the fiddle by then, but she was m measuring it out very carefully. And, and but she always, well, she was always wonderfully musical what she did. So um, we just had th three, four, five songs that we could make a set out of right um one of them was a norma solo which was which stole that stole the show every night which was a song written by a a, a um a kent miner's wife because it was during it was, um, an awful lot of trouble with the, with, with the uh with, with, with the miners the you know, coal miners in mm -hmm. uh all, all over britain uh, it was it's a wonderful song. I'm, just, I'm, I'm str struggling to remember. Um, what was it? Uh, it's coal, 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 not dole. Coal, not dole. Right. Coal, not dole. <laughs> I remember that one. That was yeah. And it was, and, and we had a, we had a couple of other a couple of other songs that uh, Liza and I d did, and Norma would sing. Um, one of them was about uh, a, a, a bloke watching a swallow building a nest, and then he, how jealous he was of this uh, of this swallow that he could. He, he, the person singing the song wants to get out of there, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, so, well, maybe that was the swallow built her nest. See that. See the. the see there's something. See the freedom of that bird. It made it made your soul unrest. Hmm. Well, well, a lovely song. I think we we sort of gone off it after a while, but I, I always liked it. I mm -hmm. always liked it. But I'm a I'm a sentimental old bugger. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, confession number four hundred and thirty three. Right. right. <laughs> but I always I always had a huge soft spot for that because and that we we had enough for a set, and the three of us did a did a did a marvelous little set. And got tremendous applause, 
the one who absolutely blew me away, I must say, because I I knew that, that she was a, a, a call her a formidable musician, doesn't even begin to 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 uh, to, to cover it, and that's Peggy Seeger. Oh yeah, she sang it. She sang a couple of songs. One of them was about um, one of them was about about cigarette smoking, about about, about tobacco, which was just astonishing and the, the other one was what i can only describe as a sort as a, as a, as a torch song mm -hmm. and she sang it basically this this is her conversing with with, with a prospective lover when she's and she's basically saying to him you don't know how lucky you are <laughs> very nice and that's that's what the song is called you don't know how lucky you are she sang <laughs> it and she sang it as a torch song and it was just riveting and astounding well, you know, congratulated her afterwards, just because you actually began to get a, 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 an instinct of, of of that woman's range. Yeah, well, and she's one of emotional. Yeah. Her emotional range is astonishing, and she's yeah. made a couple of albums in more recent times, which which are just breathtaking. Oh, she met, did a song about the Titanic, which is oh, absolutely yes, you amazing. Know, you know the song singer songwriter and performer and she's one of our favorites here at the library too we have many of her collections and her family's yeah. collections here so um uh, we've worked with her quite a bit and you can find videos of her on the library of congress website in fact at Wonderful. our symposia and things so yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so so this led ultimately to uh the first tour for Watterson Carthy, or how did that work out? Well, we just we we we, we decided that we were gonna 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 make make some kind of an album, and uh, we did a few gigs, and um, made an album. We asked Tony Engel at Topic if he'd like to do an album, and he just looked at looked at looked at us and looked at Norma and said, "What kind of a question is that?" <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I want an album. Come on, right, <laughs> right. Stop. <laughs> Get working. <laughs> and so we did, and we just uh, did produce that first album, which was uh, which I I treasure. I do love that first album because we, and well, apart from anything else, we uh, we uncover that lovely song, the uh, the song that came from uh, the, the 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 fellas at. Um, at Staves, the Staves Fisherman's Choir. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's you're going to tell me what the name of the song is now. It's the. <laughs> uh, that's not the one that was a Sankey hymn. That's it. That's yeah. The one. Um, we have it as, of course, I bid you good night. I bid you good night. Version yeah. of that song, but I I can't no. remember what that earlier version was called. Yeah. yeah. So. And it's, yeah. It, yeah. I had the name just then. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no, not your fault. Um, and I'll suddenly remember it and interrupt myself in a, in, in a second. Well, I'll tell I'll tell I've, our listeners that I've I've written a blog post about some of our versions of that song mm -hmm. where I do mention this, and so the title is in there. If you look for "I Bid You Good Night" on the Library of Congress blog, oh, well, you I'll will find <laughs> the yeah. uh, the the reference that Martin is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we were so happy to have got this recording. When, when Norma first, was handed it and she played it to me, I, thought, I just said, "Bloody hell, that's 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 the original version of, of, isn't it? That's that's it." And he said, "Norma just looked at me with a great big smile on her face and said, <laughs> yep. And we Amazing.' It. And we and, and we just sang it, and everything just fell into place. Absolutely perfect. That's that. wonderful." And yeah, you know, we just seemed to me we just went from strength to strength. Uh, we 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 did invite um, Liza had met this this young lad called Saul Rose, who mm -hmm. was uh, he he was he, he was a good melodeon player, and he he turned up at the Watford Folk Club, and played a couple of played a couple of tunes. One of which he'd learned from uh, from Andy. Oh. Ah, what's your surname, Andy? He's a wonderful, wonderful box player. Andy Cutting. Uh, Andy Cutting. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, <laughs> this is an effort of memory. This. I, I, it takes I a village sometimes. These, yeah. I should. I should write all these names down and have them in a list in front of me. Um, yeah, Andy Cutting, and the second one was a John Kirkpatrick tune, mm -hmm. and um, 
I mean, he played the Andy Cutting tune, and it was it was it was Andy Cutting, and then he played the John Kirkpatrick tune, and I mean, John has that massive box with all those right. bases on it, and and Saul managed to play the whole thing, and Liza went up to him afterwards and invited him to to, to join, join with her and and eventually with us, mm-hmm. and I just said, what, what are you doing? He said. <laughs> so he can play, but he doesn't have a repertoire. I can give him a repertoire. That was her, you know, that was how confident she was, because she'd been going through every every single tune book that was available, and a lot that weren't. <laughs> right. And she would she would when she got a new book, she would sit on 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 our, on our stairs, in the, in the house that we lived lived in, she would sit on our stairs and she would play every tune in the book. Because her sight reading was absolutely wonderful, she would play all these tunes, and our next door neighbour was the milkman, and occasionally mm-hmm. it would wake them up, and uh, and they they would say something. Oh, we heard Liza playing last night, and I said, "Oh, terribly sorry, did she wake you up?" He said, oh, "No, no, don't don't stop her. We, <laughs> we, we, we hear her playing, and we, and we love it. So no, no, it just sends us back off to sleep. That's fine. No, don't stop her." Because you were playing that's in, very in, sweet, in, yeah. in the. Oh, I thought so, and that, that was. Uh, that was the place that sounded the best. You'd sit on the on the on the hall stairs and it would echo up up to the top of the house. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. So yep. Yeah. yeah. That, that was and we we made several albums and it was we had a great time on the road and Norma oh Norma was the was the, the most fabulous fabulous leader. She led by example. It was just extraordinary. Very, very exciting. Most Wonderful. exciting. I guess I think it's probably the, one of the very, very exciting things that I've been involved involved in in, in my and and helped to create <laughs> um, in my in my entire musical life. Absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. Well, there was one more project that I wanted to talk about before turning to more thematic questions about your relationship to songs, and that was Brass Monkey because it was mm-hmm. such an interesting uh, group combining brass with um, diatonic button accordions and uh, and guitar and singing. So explain how Brass Monkey came about. Um, well, I was working at the National Theatre and doing a, a, a dramatization of the of the of the book um, Lot Rise to Candleford. And Keith, uh, the, the 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 playwright was was uh, was Keith Dewhurst, and what he'd done was get the uh, the, the book Lark Rise to Candleford, and it's split into two: Lark Rise and then Candleford. Right. And he got Lark Rise, and he t- took every 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 line in it that had that that had uh, inverted commas, <laughs> 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 any 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 kind of speech. He 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 just lifted it out and put it on a piece of paper and then stitched it all together into a script. Um, and what it was, it was, it, it was extraordinary, but what, what it required of the actors was for them to believe that this, this, this stuff was coming out of their mouths for the first time. Well, I think actors have to do that anyway. That's right. Yeah. Um, but, and they went at it with a will. They, they really did. And when we when we did the first um, <laughs> the first run through, of ha- having rehearsed the whole thing, I think it was something like three hours long, and so we had to do a bit of uh, a bit of fairly serious pruning. So um, I, I always remember Bill Bryden standing up to in, in front of everybody and saying, "Everybody's going to be upset." They're going to lose some of their favourite bits. You're all going to do it. You're, you're, but it has to be done. And I'm going to do it. And if you want to throw things at me, come and do it. But don't expect me to change. <laughs> and he just went went at it with with his pruning knife. And, and there was oh no, <laughs> a lot of yeah. oh, oh, that's my favourite bit. Well, I warned you. Um, I'm sure some of them were his favourite bits as well. That's oh, yeah, absolutely. Sort of how it goes, some, yeah. <laughs> some, great, some great moments. There were some great moments in it. 
Yeah. But um, it was it, it needed to be done. And I'd been one of the people who was fortunate enough to be in the band. I was I was a guest singer with the with, with the with the Albion band. Right. Um, and there were, there were other guests, guest singers and guest musicians. But what 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 it did was introduce me to a trumpet player called Howard Evans. He's now the late Howard Evans, mm. who was uh, really curious. He, he was really, really interested in, in, in traditional song. And he kept talking about, you know, about, about Vaughan Williams and how much Vaughan Williams loved the Aeolian mode. And he said, are there really songs in the Aeolian? I said, yeah, yeah, of course there are. I sang him a couple of them and he went, oh, oh my God, that's fabulous. And I was making an album at the time, making an album called um, <laughs> Because It's There. Um, and it was a very important album for, for me, actually, because I was beginning to get hold of a, of a, of a more sensible way of singing because um, I got, got into all sorts of stupid habits with my singing in the 70s. And, uh, and getting out of it was important, getting out of those habits. And 78, the album was released. And what, what, what happened was that um, I started to make the album and I'd asked John Kirkpatrick to be involved and he, and he was, and we played a few things together. And at one point I said, uh, yeah, this, this trumpet player, can I, can I, do you, uh, what I'd like to do is ask him to, to be on that album. Would you mind? He said, no, I don't mind. Oh, <laughs> go, do, do, do what you want. It's your album. So, okay, I, I went and asked Howard if he'd like to play on a couple of tracks. And he was, oh, he was really excited. And I don't remember how, how many he, he, uh, he played on eventually on that, on that, on that album, maybe three or four. Yeah. And he was, um, he was really prepared to work hard. He didn't have to work hard. All he had to do was play, play the melody. And I, he said, who's that bloke? Who's that bloke playing squeeze box? I said, he's, he's good, isn't he? I said, yeah, that's John, John Kirkpatrick. Oh. So they met, they met through, through, through earphones, you know, and um, they met later on and, uh, I mean, John is a formidable, formidable musician, and uh, and he then said, "Well, why don't we uh, why don't we ask Howard? Why don't you ask Howard if he'd like to come and do a couple of gigs with us? Because we were doing duo gigs." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Yeah, we can do that. We, you know, he's just give it, get, give him some music, and he went, all right." And gave him a few a few of the tunes, and. He just fell into it. He just loved it. I just thought it was utterly wonderful. And uh, he said, "Do you don't mind if I have the music? Because I, I, I can't, I can't work without music. I need the music in front of me." And he said, "Oh, don't worry about that. Yeah, just we'll get have, have a music stand, and you, you're going to play on. You're going to get what you need. You do it." So he did, and he made a he made made it his made it hit something to aim at that he yeah. was going to, he was going to do a gig without looking at the music and he said you know, I always remember him coming off the stage one night but when it was still a trio and he said uh, never looked at the music once like tonight and I said well done he said oh no, it's, a, it's a big moment <laughs> <laughs> okay but then John said why don't we expand he said I can get Martin Brinsford and he he plays all sorts of percussion and he plays um, C melody sax and he plays wonderful mouth organ. He's, he's a great harmonica player. And said, yeah, all right. And he said, uh, and, and Howard said, well, why don't I ask Roger? Roger, Roger Williams was part of the, 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 the Lark Rise band. Right. Why don't, I, why don't I ask him? Yeah, okay, we'll do that. And so we, we, we managed to have... A rehearsal with four fifths of what became Brass Monkey. Um, two rehearsals, um, and they were all different four fifths. So when we <laughs> stood up on the stage at, uh, at uh, Tellum, just outside Hastings, we had no idea what it was going to sound like. And uh, it was, it, we, we all stood on the stage and said, Are you ready, John? She said, Yeah. 
okay, well, here we go. One, two, three, four, and he launched into it. And we started to play and we, and I just started to laugh because it was so bloody brilliant. Oh, so exciting. And there were, I mean, two superb players, especially, especially, especially Roger. He could play anything on that plumping trombone, bass trombone. Oh, yeah. Astonishing musician. Oh. And it, it's funny because it's not something you ever saw on the folk scene, really, these, you know, brass musicians, but it was part of rural English traditional Absolutely. music of village bands always had uh kind of brass instruments in them so you know yeah. it yeah so it's What's kind of yeah, an affectation of the folk scene to not have them in a way yeah it, yeah I mean, people were talking about well, we really like your experimental band i said it's not an <laughs> experimental band it's people making music right <laughs> And you know, and that that see that 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 went down quite well. But you know, try try to be really blunt about it. Yeah. But um, it was just a f it was a fabulous band. Yeah. It really was. Yeah, and again, made some great recordings that that yeah. people can still hear today. So wonderful. Well, thanks for talking about that. And like I said, I before we finish, I'd like to turn to some more general questions about your uh your work and your attraction to these songs. So. What what does still draw you to old songs after all this time? Um, well, old songs are are, are, uh, are a record of some of the appalling things that human beings do to each other. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just just terrifying, it's terrifying things that people get up to. <clears throat> um, they're, they're 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 as good as any. They're as good as any, anything else anywhere else. You know, it's the, some of the stories you get in opera are, are, are as, as heartrending as that. But these 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 songs managed to do it in in a fraction of the time, right? With uh, and you you if you if you need to do any adjusting any any, any linguistic adjusting, you're you're welcome to do it. You can do what. The, the, the wonderful thing about traditional music is it's is it's your playground. You can yeah. do what you, you do what you damn please with it, and just you know just just keep telling the truth. Basically, tell you try and find out the truth in the song. Yeah, and then then you're free. Then you're free, and you, you very often find yourself actually cutting, cutting, you know, just cutting it right down. So yeah, there it is now. What do you think of that? Yeah. What do you think of them potatoes? It's just, it's it's a, there's, a, and it's the wonderful thing about those old songs is that the, the, the more you sing them, the more you find out about them. I mean, there's still things I'm still think, of course, why am I surprised? There's still things I'm finding out about it. You know, what a, what a position to be in. Yeah. You know, you don't. You know what's what, what's going to. You're going to walk around the corner, and somebody's going to jump up and bite you on the bum. Ow! <laughs> what are you doing? What do you think of that one over there? You know, okay. You know, it's 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 a fabulously privileged position that I that I'm in. You know, thank you very much. I'm 80 years old, and there's still so so much to find out. The more you find out, the more there is to find out. Yippee! Isn't that great? <laughs> that is lovely. And, you know, I think that is a good sentiment, possibly, on which to say we could talk all day, but we don't have the time with the crew to continue forever. And so we may have to cut this interview short at this point. But okay. that was just a beautiful sentiment to have right there at the end uh, of, uh, of what was a lovely two-part interview with the wonderful Martin Carthy. So Martin, mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming back and doing a second part of this interview so we could get uh, more insights on your career and your connection to this wonderful music that you've been playing now for, as I said, about 60 years. Thank you so well, much. My pleasure, thank you very much. The only, the only quibble I've got is that I've never had a career. <laughs> I, I don't have a career. Lucky old me, I don't have a career. 
Well, I will. I stand corrected. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's something I, I I failed to say last time, and I just just I don't have a career. It's one of one of the wonderful things about this music. It takes you somewhere. You can't. You can't. You, you, you can't do anything other than just follow your nose. It's wonderful. So, There's so you've had a something. you've had a life in music rather than a career. Absolutely, what a life! What a lucky lad! Oh boy, thank wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank anybody. Thank music. <laughs> <laughs> thank you once again to Martin Carthy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much.